let's get started hello everyone um, i'm lokesh today i'll be discussing about ozone uh, the ozone architecture how it compares with the hgfs architecture and some of the performance improvements a little background about myself uh, i'm a senior software engineer in cloudera i have been contributing to apache ozone apache ratus and apache hadoop for the past 4 plus years Currently, I hold PMC and committer privileges for uh, these projects. So we'll start with a basic introduction about Ozone, and then we'll uh, dive a bit deeper into the architecture. And at last, we'll be discussing some of the performance improvements. So Ozone is a distributed object store. The namespace comprises of volume, buckets, and keys. The Ozone namespace can be accessed using Object Store, File System, and S3 API. So Ozone started off as a sub-project in Hadoop, but currently it is a top-level project in Apache. So now let's uh, dive a little deeper into the architecture. So Ozone implements a uh, Ozone file system, and that is an implementation of Hadoop compatible file system API. This API has been contributed uh, mainly by the Hadoop community, and most of the uh, major big data applications today, as well as major cloud storage providers, they provide their own implementation of this API. Similarly, Ozone uh, provides its own implementation called Ozone file system. The non-big data apps can access Ozone using the S3 API. So Ozone has been designed to coexist uh, with HDFS in a same cluster. What that means is the Ozone data node uh, can exist on the same physical host as HDFS data node, and both these clusters can operate without interfering in each other's operations. So now let's look at the HDFS architecture and then we'll do a comparison with Ozone. So HDFS uh, all has data nodes. These data nodes are the storage nodes which store the block data or file data. And data nodes uh, manage all these blocks uh, as well as the volumes or disks inside that physical host. Periodically, data nodes would be sending block reports to name nodes. The name node uh, would then be receiving all these block reports from all the data nodes. It makes sure that every block is sufficiently replicated in the system. In case it finds that a block is under replicated, it will issue a replication for that block. And if, if it finds that a block is over replicated, it will issue a deletion for that block. So name node maintains a block map. Uh, which maps the block ID to set of data nodes, which hold the block replica. So this block map is uh, accessed and used by name node to uh, make sure that blocks are sufficiently replicated. Further, namespace, name node also keeps uh, the entire namespace and it stores this namespace in RAM. The namespace comprises of a uh, namespace map, which is a mapping from file to set of blocks. So every block uh, is is represented by a block ID, which is globally unique in HDFS. So now let's look at the Ozone architecture. So one more thing that the name node would be keeping the entire namespace in RAM. So this is a major problem with name node, uh, which causes it to not scale more than 300, 400 million files. Beyond those many files, uh, name node would see a lot of GC pressure, uh, which leads to hindrance of performance. Ozone also has data nodes. The data nodes are storage nodes, but instead of uh, managing the blocks, the data nodes in Ozone are managing containers. So container is a collection of and by default, the container is 5 GB in size. 
So this is uh, order of 100x reduction in terms of number of entities which a data node has to manage. HDFS data node would be handling all these blocks, whereas Ozone data node would be handling only the containers. Then Ozone data node, like HDFS data node, uh, would be sending container reports to SCM. So the namespace uh, and the block space is separate in Ozone. The container reports uh, are sent by data nodes to SCM. And SCM makes sure that all the containers are sufficiently replicated in the cluster. SCM also maintains a container map, which is a mapping from container ID to set of data nodes. So if you look at the container map, this is also the, the overhead of this map uh, would be much less uh, as compared to the block map, given the container abstraction. Further, Ozone also has a different metadata component called Ozone Manager. This is the namespace manager. It maintains the namespace map. Uh, that is, it stores the entire namespace in RockCV. And every file is, can be, is mapped to a set of blocks. Every block is represented by a block ID, which is a combination of container ID and local ID. Local ID is local to the container. Further, Ozone Manager only keeps the word working set in RAM. So this is one major optimization which Ozone Manager has uh, today. And this is different from STFS name node since Ozone Manager is not uh, keeping the entire work, working space or, or the namespace in RAM. It can scale to billions of uh, keys. Further, Ozone also provides a recon server. The recon server is a background service which can be accessed by the admin to identify any corrupted files or missing containers in the cluster. There is a very clean separation of block layer and namespace layer. This helps in easier management of Ozone cluster. So Ozone carries forward the best of HDFS. It can scale to uh, thousands of nodes. Then it has a fault tolerant storage layer. All the metadata and data updates in uh, Ozone are go through RAS consensus protocol. So this makes sure that Ozone is a strongly consistent system. The storage and compute can scale independently. Further, Ozone also provides uh, rolling upgrades uh, as well as big basic apples and range of pluggability. Ozone architecture allows uh, for a scale of 1 trillion objects. Currently, Ozone has been tested with 10 billion objects. The trillion object scale can be achieved through some optimizations around small files. Then uh, Ozone also uh, provides much uh, larger data node density. It can support data nodes uh, with a capacity of 400, 500 TB, whereas HDFS can only support a data node of around uh, 100 TB. Beyond that, it can be block reports, and uh, there are other problems which can be seen by the node. So the container abstraction is one major advantage which Ozone has, and it helps it achieve uh, or manage data nodes with that large capacity. Further, the heap is tied to working set and not to number of files in Ozone. So this, that is why Ozone does not see uh, the same kind of GC problems which name node experiences. Further, it also has Ozone's faster startup. Ozone a manager would only load a working set in RAM and SCM data nodes, uh, data nodes would only be sending the container reports uh, as compared to block reports. So since data node is managing much lesser number of entities, the startup time uh, decreases for Ozone. Further, the master, uh, that is the metadata component uh, services in Ozone and data nodes can be co-located if needed. This is good for a small or uh, embedded system. Kind of cluster. 
some of the design principles which Ozone is based on. It provides strong consistency. So this comes from the RAS consensus protocol. All the metadata and data updates in Ozone happen through RAS consensus. Ozone has a very simple architecture. It uses a central master node for managing the namespace and another metadata component for managing the container space. So all these optimizations were uh, kept in mind while designing Ozone and it also provides much better operational ease for uh, SVN or user. Ozone uses a proven building block like RAS, ROPS TV, Hadoop Security. All of these technologies have been tested uh, in various companies and in various open source projects. Ozone is 100% open source and it is part of Apache Hadoop since day one. Today, it is a top level project in Apache. So let's go through a write key and read key workflow. For writing a key, client would uh, make a create key call to Ozone Manager. Ozone Manager in turn calls SCM to allocate a block. This block is associated to a container, which is further associated to a pipeline. So pipeline is a set of data nodes, and all these data nodes uh, would store the container, and the block would also be written to all these data nodes. So for writing the data, client will make uh, communicate to these data nodes and it will write the data. All the data writes happen via RAS consensus protocol. So the it is through RAS consensus that is made sure that the data writes happen in at least in majority of the data nodes. Once client has written uh, all of its data, it can make a commit key call to Ozone Manager and that will update the Ozone Manager name. For reading a key, client will make a get key call to Ozone Manager. Ozone Manager in turn returns key location info. So this key location info uh, would contain information regarding the block uh, of the corresponding key. Every block would also have information uh, regarding the set of data nodes where that particular block is present. And then client can access or communicate with these data nodes to read the data block. So now let's look at the namespace layer in Ozone. So Ozone namespace comprises of volumes, buckets, and keys, as discussed earlier. Volumes are like user or uh, admin accounts in Azure. And then buckets and keys are similar to what S3 provides today. Further, Ozone is a strongly consistent system. All the metadata updates in the namespace happen through RAS consensus protocol. Renames and encryption are only supported at bucket level today. Active can are supported at volume buckets and directories. The ranger-based uh, prefix policies can are also supported in Ozone today. So as we discussed earlier, the namespace can be accessed using Hadoop compatible file system API as well as the S3 API. Ozone Manager keeps only a working set in RAM, and uh, it is advisable to keep store the Ozone Manager namespace in SSP disk to reduce the cache miss uh, latency. The entire namespace in Ozone Manager is stored in Rocks TV, and uh, the metadata updates are replicated using the RAS consensus protocol. To further increase the scale of Ozone Manager, sharding can be done at bucket or volume in the future. So now let's look at the storage layer. In Ozone, the storage layer is strictly separate from namespace layer. The storage layer comprises of containers, data nodes, and SCM. So container is a unit of replication in Ozone by default 5 GB in size. It stores a collection of blocks. All the data writes inside the containers happen via raft consensus protocol. Every container has a unique container ID, which is global uh, in SCM. 
every block uh, has is a represented by a block id block id is a combination of container id and local id local id is specific to that container where the block is stored then we have data nodes so data nodes are the physical host storage nodes they manage the underlying disk on the physical host as well as the container creation logic periodically data nodes send container reports to scm and scm makes sure that all the containers are sufficiently replicated uh, in the cluster so scm is more of a cluster manager it it is receiving all these uh, data node reports and it is taking action based on if a uh, data node is dead or for uh, if a data node is decommissioned the scm would take the appropriate action uh, in the cluster now let's look at the structure of a storage container so a container would comprise of rocksdb instance the rocksdb maintains a mapping from block id to set of files where that block data is stored rocksdb also maintains other metadata related to the container uh, or the block like check some deletion metadata further container also stores uh, data files or chunk files the the file stores the actual block data the container structure allows for some optimization smaller blocks which are less than 1 mb in size can be stored directly in rocksdb further the block data or multiple block files can be uh, compacted into a single file so all of these are improvements which can be done in the future container exists in two states mainly today so uh, one is the open state in the open state the container is Uh, can still receive active data writes the number of open containers in the uh, system are always it is made sure that it is uh, at least number of spindles into number of data nodes so this makes sure that all the disks inside all the data nodes are uh, used for data writes and then we also have the closed state so as we discussed container has a default size of 5 gb So, in case container reaches its uh, configured size, or if there is a failure in data writes, the containers are closed. Closing a container uh, provides consistency guarantee. So, as we know, that container is replicated to multiple data nodes, and closing the container uh, provides the consistency guarantee, and it will help SCM to determine the final state for the container. Uh, we have been discussing about the raft consensus uh, ozone uses apache ratus for raft consensus uh, protocol so apache ratus is a java implementation of raft consensus protocol and it is used by uh, data node om as well as scm today the uh, typical configuration here would be a uh, leader uh, a leader node and the leader node is communicating to the follower node so a ratus client uh, would make a client raft request to the leader node the leader node would append the entry in its own log once the entry has been appended it will also forward the these entries to the follower node so once it receives a majority at so that is if leader has appended the entry in its own log as well as the follower replies that uh, it has also appended the entry in its own log then the leader can uh, successfully uh, respond to the client so this configuration is similar for uh, ozone manager storage container manager scm as well as the data node in ozone manager uh, the similar in ozone manager and scm this is used for uh, providing high availability service metadata service all the metadata operations uh, critical metadata operations like create key create volume all of these uh, go through raft consensus protocol further in data nodes we have a similar configuration the leader data node is receiving all the data write requests from the uh, 
Amazon Prime. Leader data node is forwarding these requests to the follower. So, uh, Raft is basically majorly used for metadata replication. So, as we discussed, that Rattus is used for, or Raft is used for uh, data replication as well. And uh, there were some performance improvements which were required in order to use Raft for data replication. So one major improvement uh, which was done was that the data rights are not appended to the Raft block. They are written directly to the containers in SCM. Another optimization which can be done is Raft journal or the Raft block can be stored in a separate disk in order to make use of uh, contiguous size. So this is the typical ozone architecture. Um, we have the ozone manager, storage container manager, and the data node. The S3 gateways listen into S3 requests. S3 buckets can be mounted in a cube container, and they are also accessible using the S3 browser. Further, the namespace can be accessed using uh, ozone file system uh, or Hadoop compatible file system. So that was uh, the architecture. Uh, now we'll look at some of the performance improvements. The performance improvements are a subset of all performance improvements in Ozone, and uh, these are mainly where I have been involved in. So we can uh, divide these improvements into two basic components, uh, metadata improvements as well as data improvements. So one basic uh, improvement which we did for high throughput was to use read-write locks. And read-write read locks, uh, using read-write lock helps achieve a much higher read throughput. And this helps uh, in so all the readers of the Ozone Manager uh, can access the Ozone Manager namespace. Then we also uh, made improvements to make use of horizontal scalability. So for this, uh, we there were some changes made in the block allocation algorithm. So earlier block allocation used to be done uh, from set of containers. So there were a set of containers which were maintained in SCM. And for allocating a block, a container was selected from the set and a corresponding block was allocated. So a change which was made here was to add a level of indirection that is the pipeline. So instead of selecting the containers, now uh, SCM would select a pipeline from this set of pipelines. And then from this pipeline, it will uh, select the container. So selecting the pipeline, uh, so since pipeline is a set of data nodes, this is essentially like selecting the set of data nodes where that block is written. Even a random uh, algorithm for selecting the pipeline helped in uh, achieving a much uh, balance for block allocation in the cluster. So this is very important in order to use all the data nodes in the cluster. So then we also have uh, some of the data improvements. So as we know that Ozone, uh, the data rights are GBs in size, and we can't be very wasteful uh, with, in terms of memory with Java. So Java penalizes uh, a lot in terms of GC time. So we have seen this configuration for uh, data nodes. So data nodes, uh, there is a leader data node which is communicating to the follower data node, and the client is communicating or sending the data write request to the leader data node. So if we look at the leader data node, it is for every X amount of data it is receiving from the client, it is uh, processing three X amount of data. Because it is receiving that data from the client and it is also forwarding that data to, to the follower. So uh, we also have, so the leader has a limit in terms of the number of pending entries or requests uh, which it can manage. So in in uh, in Rattus, we have 
the the limit as 1 GB. So that is the default limit. If uh, the leader is receiving more than 1 GB data, it will fail all those requests uh, in the client. So what we could see was that the client was retrying with fixed retry policy and the default interval was three seconds. And the leader, uh, so let's take a scenario where leader already has one GB of pending data, right? And the client uh, would keep sending this uh, these requests every three seconds and leader will keep failing these requests. So this was creating a lot of garbage in the leader data now and it used to cause a lot of GC pressure uh, in the data node. In order to reduce some of the GC pressure, we introduced a more uh, exponential or linear backup policy, which were more aggressive. So we'll look at these policies in the next slide. So for, uh, there are two types of retries in, in uh, Rattus client. In case, the client finds that the leader has reached its uh, limit of 1 GB pending right, it will retry with exponential backup. So the first retry would be 4 seconds, then 8 seconds, and so on. For the other retries, it was using a linear backup policy now. So initial 5 retries, uh, the retry interval is 5 seconds, and the next 5 retries, it would be 10 seconds, and so on. So this, these retry policies uh, were, were aggressive um, and they helped in providing much better stability to the uh, ozone data pipeline. So as we were discussing, uh, the data pipeline is processing GBs of data. And one major problem which we saw was buffer copies. So in for, uh, data transfer, we use gRPC uh, in Ozone, and gRPC internally uses protobuf. For, and what we saw was that the serialization and deserialization of protocol buffers uh, involved uh, buffer copies. And in some of the claim graphs, we saw that this could cost around 30% of CPU time. So some of the latest releases in gRPC, uh, I think 1.39.0, has introduced a fix uh, for the uh, deserialization buffer copy. We still have to include that fix in also. So, uh, other uh, memory bugs, uh, we saw that the memory was being retained in cache. So we had a retry cache for leader to follower uh, data transfer. And the cache entries would have a timeout of three seconds. And in case uh, the leader has a lot of uh, data which needs to be transferred to the follower data nodes, we'll, we'll see that the entire uh, data request was being, uh, uh, was being maintained in the cache. So instead of in, uh, keeping only the metadata related to the request, we were holding on to the entire uh, block data. And uh, this led to a lot of uh, uh, memory retention in the cache, and it was causing uh, a lot of GC pressure in the uh, data. So some other blog bugs related to memory uh, were unintentional buffer copies. We saw that buffer copies would happen uh, due to unintentionally uh, writing the block data to the log files or uh, other uh, buffer copies in the cluster. So, and then we also had some one-line fixes. Uh, these required a lot of time uh, in debugging, but uh, the final solution would require only a one-line fix. So, one of the earliest ones uh, which we saw was with gRPC. And gRPC uses Netty for data transfer. And what we saw was Netty was assigning a lot of thread caches for non-Netty threads. So in case gRPC is making a buffer hold a request to Netty, the Netty would assign uh, thread caches to the following thread. And these thread caches were assigned both on heap and off heap. 
So what we saw that uh, a lot of these thread caches were being uh, generated in the Java heap. And Netty exposes uh, JVM property to disable this, these thread caches uh, in Netty. So once we started using this property, we saw that the GC time reduced from three minutes to around 37 seconds. So without this improvement, it would have been very difficult to use uh, gRPC for data transfer uh, in Uber. And another one, uh, it, it, it was a very simple mistake. So what we found that the data node was consuming a lot of memory uh, in Ozone. And so if you take a scenario, uh, we saw with 200,000 containers in the Ozone data node, it was consuming around 30 GB of uh, residence set size. After a lot of JE malloc analysis and other analysis, we saw that most of this uh, memory was off heap and it was being used by RocksDB cache. And uh, earlier we thought that this might be some RocksDB bug which we were encountering, but it turned out it was a very simple mistake where instead of configuring the cache to 64 MB, we were configuring the cache to 64 DB. So the configuration was 64 MB, but somehow in between uh, while passing to the RocksDB, we were multiplying 64 MB by another MB and passing on 64 TB. So 64 TB of Prox TB cache was acting like an uh, unbounded cache. It was caching all the blocks. With this improvement, we saw that uh, on startup, idle data node, uh, the memory consumption decreased from 20 TB to 3 TB. So that's all for uh, in performance improvement. Uh, you can reach me on my email ljan at apache.org in case of any queries or feedback. Thank you. So looking at performance, is Ozone compatible to HDFS performance or is it fast? So from uh, based on some of the benchmarks which we have run uh, around Terragen, Ozone performance is similar to HDFS performance. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but we were around 70, 80% of or 80 or 90% of HDFS performance. Is Ozone being used on production systems as of today? Yes, so Ozone, we have a community partner uh, in Tencent. So Tencent is actively using Ozone in their own production cluster. And we also have uh, some customers in Cloudera which are using Ozone. Any other questions? All right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I'll be. Yeah. We can close the session.